Some of us have a lot of time. I'm blessed. Some of us don't. But it's what you do with the time that you are allotted. Like love, keep it alive. Like anything in this world, it's going to take your time and attention and your love. Progress, evolution, advancement is not made by stepping away, by neglecting, by saying no. It's made by saying yes. And when we ask what was so great, what was so amazing, what was so unique about Martin Luther King, well, maybe nothing, maybe nothing, except he said yes, again and again and again, even when he didn't want to. What made him one of the most revered figures in American history? And when you ask people around the world, you know, famous Americans, who are they? Ah, Lincoln, of course, and probably Kennedy, but always Dr. Martin Luther King, always, wherever you go. Or is that just me? <laughs> I don't know. Then again, maybe it's something along the lines of what James Baldwin told us. The story of the Negro in America is the story of America. My friend, black historian Emma Lipsansky at Haverford College said about Martin Luther King that he was a theological vessel into whom God downloaded tools and which he used magnificently. And I think I, that's what I tend to agree with. Like all of us, he was given, he embodied, he had tools that he repeatedly said yes, 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 and used them. Dr. King was a remarkable man. History and public affairs professor Manning Marable said about him, Martin Luther King had more confidence and faith in American democracy and the Constitution and in the principles of fairness and opportunity than nearly all of his critics. That certainly can be said today with the state of affairs in the United States, politics particularly. Who was King? He was the son of a Baptist minister, Daddy King. <laughs> Daddy King Sr., who was a disciplinarian. That's what he put first. He was known for saying that he would beat young Martin until, until he made something of himself. King graduated high school at 15, maybe because of that discipline, and went to his daddy's alma mater, Morehouse, in uh, Atlanta. But from there, he defied his father. When he wanted him to go to his seminary, Martin Luther King went to Crozier Seminary, not very far from here, in Upland, Upland Chester area. And while he was a shy young man, who wasn't confident at all, and he didn't believe that he had good looks or what it took to get girls, he did have the gift of gab, which he had used throughout his life. And that is where he honed his incredible power to speak in a way that made, that moved people, that made people want to do things. So he also, at that particular time, fell for a white girl, the, son, the daughter of a cook. And they came to the mutual agreement that this probably was not the time and the place in the late 40s for an interracial marriage. Probably wouldn't work out. In fact, they might not even survive. Having attained his Doctor of Divinity a couple years later at Boston College, he came home. And he did defy his parents by once again marrying outside the powerful Black Baptist Church uh, in Atlanta. But he did become the pastor of his father's church, Ebenezer Baptist. And it shortly came to pass, and this is now 1955, he has just gotten his divinity degree, that the Montgomery bus boycott 1955, sparked by Rosa Parks, they needed a leader. Well, Martin Luther King, the young Dr. King, was not really anxious to get, get involved in all this. But he was asked to listen because they said they were going to have the meeting at his own church. So he couldn't very well not listen. And so he realized in the course of the conversation that destiny had opened up to him. And he stepped up. Even though he was only 26 years old at the time, he stepped up. The man was to do more than anyone else in putting an end to the racist segregation that had marked America since the end of slavery. A year later, uh, he stepped into the consciousness of America when he stepped up to be the leader of the Montgomery boycott. And a year later, when the Supreme Court outlawed segregation in public transportation, 
he got his first civil rights victory, and he stepped solidly onto the pages of American history. The pleasant life that he had hoped to live with his beautiful wife, Coretta Scott, and his children was to be no more, no more forever. One month into the boycott, he began receiving death threats, 50 letters a day, threatening his life, his family, uh, everything that he held dear. His house was bombed. The police had to surround his house and protect him 24 hours a day with armed shotguns, rifles, and pistols. So this peaceful man, who had chosen nonviolence as a tactic, because he knew that if a race war broke out, black people would be annihilated. So he found himself at a crossroads, surrounded by violence and the threat of violence. Fortunately, or maybe as the result of prayer, one of his greatest mentors showed up in his life. He was a black man, a Quaker, and someone who had attended Cheney University. He came to help Martin, and when he told him, because he could see King was wavering in his nonviolent stance in the face of all these violence and all these threats, and doubting the effectiveness of nonviolence as a tactic, Bayard Rustin told him that nonviolence was not a tactic. It was a philosophy. It was a way of life. Bayard Rustin was a man who had been targeted by the FBI and anti-civil rights forces because he was an eloquent speaker and a brilliant strategist and a civil rights activist. Rustin truly believed that, that, that peace was the way to resist evil and that racial injustice was violence and violence cannot do away with violence. And his motto was, the truth that one truly believes is in action. So he wasn't about to stand still. Coretta Scott welcomed Rustin, saying, with all these guns around, I don't feel safe at all. Martin did too. Welcome, Bayard Rustin. Uh, but he had to stay in the background. At every turn, the FBI and the Republican segregationists brought up Rustin's arrest on morals charge of sexual perversion because he had been caught in a car with two men. What Rustin was, was gay, which was a crime in 1956 USA. As it happened after Montgomery, Martin was trying to figure out what to do next. Other black leaders, such as Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, viewed him as a rival. A black woman, in fact, stabbed him into the chest with a knife in 1958. She was later found out to be mentally unstable. But he was getting criticism from all sides. Some thought he was moving too fast, from black people on both sides. Some people thought he was moving too slow. He was not exactly sure how to proceed. Fortunately, inspired by his nonviolent approach, Four students in Greensboro, North Carolina, decided to take his tactic and sit down at a, lunch, a segregated lunch counter in Greensboro. Although the white crowds there were not nonviolent, the black students adhered to that philosophy and sit-ins spread across the South like wildfire, and this was in 1960. By 1961, once again with the active involvement with the support of Dr. King and the organizing genius of Bayard Rustin, a year of freedom riding began. Once again, mountain buses, black and white folks, and riding these buses across the South. If you've heard about them, they were fireballed, the riders were beaten, dragged off and beaten, all kinds of uh, havoc ensued. The nonviolence of black and white riders was met with extreme raging violence on the part of white protesters, anti-integrationists, and the police. <laughs> Captured on TV, Americans and the world, got a first-hand dose of what racial injustice meant for black Americans. It was one demonstration, one fight after another, one bigoted sheriff after another. It was in Birmingham in 1963 that the infamous Commissioner of Public Safety, Bull Connor, when he was asked if he could stop integration, he replied, if not, I'll die trying. It was Connor who opened up the fire hoses and set loose the dogs on black men and women and children. The world and much of America was horrified, which was just what Bayard Rustin had predicted and King was convinced by. 
These scenes led to the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Behind the scenes, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI were actively attempting to undermine King as they had Rustin. Hoover sent King an anonymous and threatening letter and said he was going to expose his filthy and fraudulent self to the nation unless he committed suicide. In the face of such resistance, it was Rustin who masterminded the historic and phenomenal March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which was the high point of the high point of Dr. King's leadership of the civil rights movement. They promised 100,000 people would show up on the Washington Mall, and they organized buses from church, trains from as far away as Milwaukee and California. Uh, they knocked on doors with flyers and lined up speakers and campaigned for donations. And they just asked the black folks to show up for economic justice and for freedom. The great union organizer, A. Philip Randolph, and Bayard Rustin, who was his protege, created an alliance of civil rights, union workers, and religious organizations to come together for the first time in history. It was early in the morning of August 28, 1963, when the pool between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument was still only a handful of people were milling around. The reporters rushed over to Bayard Rustin and said, where's this big demonstration you're talking about? Where are all the people? Rustin told, him all, Rustin told him all, the reporters, all was well. Little did they know that Bayard Rustin had been up all night because the sound system was, had to broadcast all the sound all across the mall because without a sound system, there would be riots breaking out and all, kind, all manner of havoc. He had wrestled with John Lewis's incendiary speak and got him to tone it down, tone it down. And the FBI infiltrators, and who knows what they were going to be up to. He kind of resigned himself to what would be would be. It was the great, the renowned historian Eleanor Holmes Norton, who was then a still young woman who worked in the offices in Atlanta organizing central headquarters for this event. She had to work late that night because somebody had to be there to answer all the phones and make sure everything went off as planned. She took a plane into Washington, D.C. the morning of the march, and she said it took her breath away to see the thousands and thousands of people lining from the monument, the Washington Monument, to the Lincoln Memorial, filling up with hundreds of thousands, later estimated to be somewhere between 200 and 300,000. They've settled on a quarter of a million. 250,000 people were there. She was taken away, and she knew that this movement was a force to be reckoned with, as did the nation. The crowd was estimated to be 75 to 80% black. And all the stars of the day were there, as were many of the white stars, celebrities. But it was Miss Mahalia Jackson that leaned over to King to whisper in his ear when things were flagging a little bit and she wanted to keep the energy up. Tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. And did he ever. You could see Bayard Rustin standing behind King in the back, nodding his head, nodding his head as if his hopes and dreams in his protege, protege once again, were blossoming and coming true. Martin Luther King had become the North Star of the movement. While the Edmund Pettus Bridge was heroically crossed in 1965 with much bloodshed, and the march from Selma to Atlanta, excuse me, Selma to Birmingham two weeks later, was King's last great march. It led to the greatest piece of legislation ever, civil rights legislation, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Yet, King's star was indeed fading. The movement was becoming more militant. Malcolm X had called the march on Washington the farce on Washington. H. Rat Brown, the Black Panther Party, Stokely Carmichael, his chant was burn, baby, burn. They were coming into a sentence. King himself was changing. He was angry about poverty, about the war in Vietnam, about which he found himself at odds with President Lyndon Johnson, who had been an ally earlier. They asked him to bow out, leave these things alone. King notably said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It was hard to promote and maintain nonviolence in the face of war, and he was getting tired, as many of his friends said. 
as he mounted his final challenge to the economic basis of American capitalism and gave his last speech in Memphis, Tennessee in April 1968. You remember it. I have been to the mountaintop. I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I fear no man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. When a preacher says he has been to the mountaintop, he means I will soon be seeing God. And the next day, April 4th, 1968, was indeed his last. How is this a story of black love? And how relevant is it to you, Cheney, students, faculty, here today? Well, Martin Luther King took the tools that God had downloaded into him, his gifts of eloquence, his love of black people, his belief in justice and goodness at the core of all people, because this was a movement of unity, black and white and rich and poor and young and old. And with the help of some friends, he put his life on the line at a crucial time in human history to change it. That's love. And how relevant is it to you? Well, it's relevant because Martin Luther King was no different than you. You too have been given innumerable, innumerable gifts, certainly everything you need to succeed. And you are just waiting because the time will come when the world steps up to you and says, do this thing, whether it is get your degree, go to graduate school, be part of a movement, say yes to a child that needs a home, help your neighbor, help your friend, help the movement, which most certainly continues. You have all the tools you need to succeed strictly within you, and you may not have to die young to use and enjoy them. So it is no coincidence that right now his granddaughter is going around the nation speaking about voting rights because this is once again a time in our history where there are many people, unlike Dr. King, who do not believe in the Constitution or American democracy, but their pension, their paycheck, their ability to get reelected. And so we'll say anything at any time to undermine this nation. What side are you on? The side of truth and integrity? The side of humanity or just yourself? That choice is you. It was given to you by God, along with all your gifts. But I leave you with the words of Dr. King's ally, Kingmaker Wright Bayard Rustin, who said, the truth one truly believes is in action. So people, get ready. Your day will come. Show some love. Thank you. Podium is yours. Oh, let me put on this mask again. Thank you.